If there's one thing mystery writers and readers agree on, it's that surprise endings are what we want. But we've got a little problem because in order for your reader to be shocked by your big reveal, they have to have met the villain but never really considered him a suspect. In this video, I'm going to give you three surefire tactics for hiding your villain right in plain sight. To see our first tactic, we're going to take a look at an episode of Murdoch Mysteries called Mild Mild West, in which two aging sharpshooters perform a bullet catch trick. Lightning Wilcox and Jaws McRollins were once famed desperados who rid a town of a notorious outlaw named Chester McGee, but now they've been reduced to performing in Buffalo Bill's Wild Wild West show. The bullet catch is simple. The shooter fires into the hay bales behind his partner, and the target reveals a bullet between his teeth, which he's been keeping in his mouth the entire time. But at the end of the trick, it's clear that something has gone wrong. Our sleuth, Murdoch, digs into the motives of the show's performers, including the headliners, Annie Oakley and John Wharton, and the owner himself, Wild Bill Cody. Meanwhile, the killer continues his work, taking out McRollin's partner, Lightning Wilcox. When Murdoch discovers a white horsehair among the trace evidence from the crime scene, he's sure he knows who the killer is. It's Wild Bill's groom, Teddy. He has a different story to tell about the confrontation between Rollins, Wilcox, and Chester McGee. According to him, Chester was just a simple farmer whose land the railroad wanted to buy, and Wilcox and McRollins had been hired to scare him off or bump him off. He also happened to be Teddy's father. This way of hiding the villain in plain sight is to use a hidden relationship. Because no one ever suspects any relationship between Teddy and the victims, we never have a reason to imagine a motive linking them together, and so Teddy flies completely under our radar. This tactic is particularly good for revenge plots, especially ones like this one, where the Avenger is a family member who was never known to the person on whom they mean to exact revenge. But this can work for any kind of hidden relationship, a hidden romance, uh, a hidden familial or financial relationship. As long as we don't understand the link between villain and victim, we will never guess who done it. For our second tactic, we're going to look at an episode of Remington Steel called Steel Searching, in which London is plagued by a series of murders that recall a certain historical crime spree. The victims are all women and the killer drives around London in a handsome cab to carry out his terrible crimes. Our sleuths, Steele and Laura, zero in on a suspect who looks just perfect. He has a history of violence, a lighter with his family crest was found at one crime scene, and he keeps a handsome cab on his estate. Oh, and he just happens to be 10th in line to the throne of England. The sleuths insert themselves into his estate as journalists, meeting his fiancée and her brother and spooking the Earl when they bring up the topic of the handsome cab. Ultimately, this case is solved in a frightening confrontation when the villain attempts to kill Laura. Bradford Galt! Who the hell is he? He's the Earl's prospective brother-in-law, the brother of that fiancé we met at the estate. Long ago, he committed a murder in a woman's boarding house in London, and all of the victims who he has killed recently were witnesses. After the murder, he fled to Canada for a number of years, but now he's back and terrified that all the publicity surrounding the Earl's wedding will allow one of the witnesses to recognize him. So he decided to preemptively eliminate them. This tactic for hiding your villain in plain sight is to make the villain a hanger-on to a more obvious suspect. Uh, the hanger-on might be an employee, a romantic interest, a relative, anyone who has a relationship with the clear suspect. This is just, it's a fabulous tactic because here's the challenge when we're trying to hide the villain in plain sight. We want to give the reader time to spend with that character, time to form an impression of him, and time to pick up a few clues. 
but we want to do that without exciting suspicion. So we need an excuse. We need a reason why the reader thinks they're spending time in this character's company. And using this tactic, the excuse is very simple. We think we're in this scene to get information about the Earl, but while we do so, the writers are able to slip in a few little facts about Galt as well, such as the fact that he lived in London when he was younger and that he dislikes publicity. If you feel like this video is helping you understand how to create a mystery novel of your own, please take just a second to hit the like button and then let's talk about our last tactic. For this one, we're going to take a look at an episode of Murder, She Wrote called Hit, Run, and Homicide, in which a man named Charles Woodley is run down by a car that appears to have no driver. Not a thing you'd expect to see in 1984. The man survives the attack, but the driverless car escapes the scene and soon runs down another victim. And this one isn't so lucky. Suspicion quickly centers on Jez's friend, Daniel. He had the know-how to program the car, he had potential motives for attacking both suspects, and as if that wasn't enough, Woodley says he came to Cabot Cove after receiving a call from Daniel, a claim Daniel vigorously denies. Things are looking pretty grim for Daniel until Jess figures out where to find the remote control device that was used to operate the car. Then she stages a second attack against Woodley. As he's fleeing, he screams out the name of his accomplice, begging her to stop the car, and thus making his own guilt clear. This tactic is to make the villain appear to be a victim. Like I said, we need an excuse to spend time with the villain, and letting him cast himself in the role of a victim who survived is the perfect way to make this happen happen. It's also a great opportunity for the villain to insert false clues that take the sleuth down the wrong path, such as Woodley's assertion that Daniel had summoned him to Cabot Cove. And because we rarely imagine that a person would commit a crime against themselves, this one always comes as a huge shocker. But if you're thinking these can't be the only ways to hide the villain in plain sight, uh, you're right. In this video, I went over three other ways to keep your villain in your story, but off your reader's radar. So if you want to really wow your readers with a big twist right at the end, you might want to check that one out next.